use this for pretty much every presentation. So thanks a lot, everyone. My name is Jeff Welpley. I am the chief architect at Get Human, and this is Patrick Stapleton, also known as Patrick JS. He runs Angular Class. Hey, guys. Over the past three months, we've been working with Tobias from the core team uh, at Angular, trying to get server rendering working with Angular 2. Patrick's going to give a demo a little later, but first I want to give some background on both this initiative and server rendering in general. It's interesting when I talk to other developers about server rendering, I get a mix of different reactions. It's sort of an even 50-50 split between people that are really psyched, that love that we're bringing Angular, uh, server rendering to Angular, and people that are oddly upset that they feel like I'm uh, walk, getting on their lawn and they want me to get off. Uh, so I want to talk about server rendering in terms of something that I know we all love and is non-controversial, namely Arrested Development. If you haven't seen, Netflix is bringing Arrested Development back for another season, and I am psyched. Yeah, <laughs> give it up. <laughs> Uh, so as soon as I saw this, I immediately had to jump onto Facebook and send a link to all of my friends. Now, as Igor kind of pointed out yesterday in the keynote, this is where one of the problems of server rendering comes in, because this feature is used on a lot of social sharing sites, and it only works with server rendered content. So if I'm trying to send a link to a web app that is only client rendered, it is blank. Then after that, I went on Google to try and buy some rest of development merchandise. And the interesting thing here is that every one of these links on this page goes to a server-rendered website. And that's not abnormal. If you go to any competitive uh, keyword, use any competitive keyword terms, it's always going to be server-rendered sites. And the reason is because although Google does index client-side rendered HTML, it's not perfect yet, and the other search engines don't do it as well. So, if you care about SEO, you still need to have server-rendered content. And then finally, I went over to one of my favorite sites on NPR that has a map of all of the reoccurring jokes on Arrested Development to the episodes that they appear in. And it's this cool client-side app that if you kind of mouse over it, it shows you all sorts of relationships and that type of thing. The only thing that sort of sucks about this uh, particular site is that if you're on an older browser, or your IT guy at work disables JavaScript for some weird reason, then you don't see anything. It's a blank screen. It would have been nice if they, for progressive enhancement, they had a server rendered just static view that you can kind of see. But they don't. So I just went over three legitimate reasons why you would want server rendering with your client-side application. But to be honest, these don't affect everyone. It's for a subset of developers, mostly people that are building consumer-based apps. And these reasons are minor compared to the most important reason that affects everyone of why you would want server rendering. And that's dealing with the web app gap. So what is this? Basically, it's the amount of time it takes during the initial page load to render your client-side application. You usually have to go through you know, your normal server response, downloading all of the assets, then there's a client initialization uh, point where like Angular is bootstrapping, and then you're pulling down data from the API, and then finally you're painting to the screen. And this can take a while. In fact, a lot of studies and my own personal experience, I'm sure the experience of many people in this room, uh, show that it's typically on the order of magnitude of three to seven seconds, sometimes more for more complex apps. And that's sort of unacceptable. There's a study recently by the Filament Group that says, over half the people they surveyed will abandon a page if it loads in over three seconds. And that happens all the time with our client-side apps. So it's a big problem. So it's something that comes from the fact that people are used to mobile apps. Mobile apps are instantly rendered and instantly functional. And they sort of have that expectation for our web apps, too. So how do we do that? How do we get past this web app gap? And there's sort of three approaches you could potentially take. The first one is to try to condense this large amount of time, this you know, three to seven seconds, down to something under a second, you know, something within people's expectation. But this is very difficult to do. It's sort of like trying to break the laws of physics. 
There are certain things outside your control, like you know, in researching for this talk, I didn't realize how bad the latency is in the San Francisco Bay Area. When I try to, uh, I'm in Bos uh, from Boston, and Patrick is, lives here in the Bay Area. You know, when we communicate back and forth, uh, there is a inherent 76 millisecond latency that you just can't do anything about. Now, in the future, we might not have this. Everything might be fast, run Google Fiber, whatever. But for right now, it's not something we're going to be able to solve. The second option or approach is to take our large app and kind of break it into smaller pieces and then serve up only what's needed. So you request a page and only the JavaScript that's needed for that page or only the CSS that's needed for that page. And then everything else kind of downloads lazily in the background. This is something that you can get to work in a prototype. People have done something like this. But from a framework standpoint, it's extremely difficult because ideally you want to be able to allow your developers to just write their code as they normally would, and then the framework kind of handles this sort of uh, runtime concern. But it's just an extremely hard problem. It's something that the Google Core team uh, has been looking at. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in as well, but we're not quite there yet. The approach that is here today and does work is server rendering. And that is where you have your client load as it normally does, but the one change is that in your server response, you include a fully rendered view so that the user can see almost immediately the page that you're trying to go to while the client downloads in the background. And then once the client is fully bootstrapped, it takes over the page, and then it's just like a normal single page app from then on. And this is something that is extremely popular these days. So every client-side framework that you can think of that is popping up has server rendering, just because we know it works. And it solves this web app gap problem. So because Angular 2 has been built from the ground up, Angular 2 has been built with this ability as well. Now, the problem in Angular 1 was that it was tightly coupled to the DOM. And in order to do server rendering, we have to break that dependency. So the way it would look in Angular 2 is that you have your Angular app that you build against the Angular 2 application layer. So all of the APIs that you're using in your, that you've seen in examples and that type of thing, the decorators, the template syntax, all that stuff that you are going to code in is part of the Angular 2 application layer. When you run your Angular 2 application, the application layer will convert what you have coded in your components and everything into several different internal data structures, one of them being uh, the view tree. And then the application layer will pass the view tree down to the rendering layer. And the rendering layer will have different adapters. So the default one is the DOM renderer. So the DOM renderer basically converts that view tree from the application layer into the actual DOM changes. It will push out to the actual browser DOM, whatever you have in your application. For server rendering, we had to work off of a different renderer. And so we're going to have this JSON renderer, which ultimately basically produces an HTML um, string, a string of uh, HTML characters that you can return from your web server or um, for testing purposes, you can also use that as well. So how will you actually use this as a developer? Uh, it's pretty, gonna be pretty straightforward, uh, at least when it's, when it's all done. It'll be you write your client-side Angular 2 web app as you normally would uh, with just one restriction. Don't directly touch the DOM. Angular 2 has a number of different abstractions that you use, different objects, in order to interact with the DOM. As long as you use those objects, then it provi will provide the abstraction when we go through this different renderer to generate HTML on the server. But if you directly touch the window element, the document, uh, document object or the window object, then uh, it becomes much tougher to kind of mimic that on the server. And then it's just a matter of installing a server plugin so that you know, if you're using Happy JS or Express or whatever you happen to be using 
on the server side in a Node.js environment, uh, it'll be able to take that same application you built for the client side and then just render it on the server. So one more thing before I pa pass it over to Patrick to kind of demo all of this. And it's something that we didn't think about when we first got started. We didn't realize that it was actually going to be a major problem, but um, it, it's something that we ultimately came up with, I think, a good solution for. And that is, when you have server rendering, and the user can see a server page right away, but the client isn't alive yet, what happens to all those user events that occur during those you know, two to six seconds or whatever? And it can cause a lot of problems. Like if you're typing in a text box, you're clicking buttons or whatever, and the client isn't actually alive to like, process those events, then you can have all sorts of unexpected behavior. So to solve this problem, we have built a library called Preboot, which is a small piece of JavaScript that gets included in the server view. Right during uh, document load time, it starts recording events. And then when the client is alive, it plays back all of those events. So what this means is that you can have a server view that appears instantly. Someone can click on a button. And then as soon as Angular wakes up, it actually processes that click. And that is something that's pretty cool. That's something that uh, no other framework that I'm aware of uh, has enabled. So that's going to be pretty awesome. And it helps us to achieve this instantly rendered, instantly functional goal. So without further ado, let me pass it over to Patrick to give a demo. All right, guys. Let me uh, switch the screen here. All right, now, um, in order to demonstrate what exactly is going on, we're going to take a brief moment and um, learn a little bit about history. So um, there's actually three generations that's going on with uh, web applications uh, today. And we're going to go back 10 years in the past, and we're going to experience uh, the first generation, and that's with a Ruby on Rails to do MVC app. Now, this is the infamous to do MVC app over here. And there's a small difference. Um, we haven't hit this, the flat design era. We're still the skeuomorphic, so that's, that's a thing to note. Um, and then the other thing is that um, if you guys don't know, with Ruby and Rails and, and Ruby, it's a server rendered, server side only uh, language. So that means that if you uh, go to the particular website, it is uh, making the query to the database, then uh, generating that inside of your HTML, and then it's sending that as a string down to the client. And then that's it. So um, what that means is that you're able to uh, type in a to do and hit enter. And then if you notice on the, the right here, it's actually reloading the page. And um, when we hit enter, what we'll call this for now an, an action. And that uh, means like an action would mean something that's changing the state of the application, state being like um, our to do's or data. So um, whenever you type in a, an action and hit enter, it's actually refreshing the page. Um, and that's the state of the applications 10 years ago. But um, one of the, the benefits of applications 10 years ago is that if you're able to refresh, you're able to see it instantly rendered instantly functional web application. But what happened is that we realized that whenever you click on something, now you can kind of see what's going on here. It, it's taking forever to kind of showcase what's going on. But then that's where we switch to a more responsive uh, nature. So now I'm going to demonstrate uh, five years in the past with single page applications. And I'm going to start that with um, rendering, rendering it by hitting it now. And as you can see, we're presented with a blank screen. And then our application loads. So what happened here? Um, well, it turns out that we pushed all of our application logic to the client. It turns out five years ago, uh, JavaScript was considered really fast. And then jQuery came out, Backbone came out, Angular came out. The nodes started um, uh, coming up in, in Atom. And um, now we have this extremely responsive um, to-do application. Now you can see that whenever I interact with it, it's extremely fast, and I'm able to um, have a instantly responsive um, application. But now we kind of have a problem here, right? Like we we have this uh, blank screen. Like this, it takes like one second to kind of load what's going on here. So how do we solve this? Well, I mean, what what do we do? We obviously we put a loading screen, right? It's, that sounds about right. It's, let's go in the code here and let's uh, let's go down the street. Let's ask our designer. Hey, let's. Give me a really nice loading screen, because our application is so large that we need 
to tell the users um, that something's happening and you know, it's, it's their problem, not ours. Now, we, when we reload the page, our users are presented with this fancy loading screen here, and then, uh, whoops, and then we're able to um, see your application. Now this is better for the user, better, better user experience, right? And then um, how would we upgrade this? Like how would we go a little bit further in the user experience and make this a little bit better for their users? Well, what we would do is we would mimic our application structure and we would kind of copy, we would, we would edit the HTML, copy it out, and then remove all the state, kind of make a, a blank uh, sheet. So now we have this here on this refresh and we have the input field here um, to kind of simulate or emulate um, like something that the application's there. But what's really going on is you're kind of, you're kind of faking it, right? Like if I type in something and then um, the, our application loads and it kind of just disappears. Like that's, that's kind of a problem. It's kind of like faking um, the application. And that's, and that's what we do today, right? Now, um, what I'm going to demonstrate to you is our solution that's actually using the server-side rendering and the client-side rendering and using this hybrid approach. Now, um, make sure you keep an eye on the, the right here because um, this is going to be really fast. Essentially, I'm going to refresh, and I don't know if you noticed, but it's already done. Um, so what happened is that with the server-side rendering, you were able to get the state and everything inside there instantly. Now, what about, what about the input problem? What about if I refresh and I start typing something? Well, now, if you notice the, the check marks at the bottom, um, there's actually client, the client-side app actually uh, loaded. And our application is instantly functional. And that's a very long to do, but yeah. Um, so now we can see that um, we have the functionality of both, both sides with this hybrid approach because of preboot, because we're able to uh, transfer state before, um, before Angular bootstraps to Angular um, right after it's done. But then now we actually present with a new problem, right? Like um, now that we solve this problem that no one solves, what if you hit enter? Right? Well, what's this? It's our infamous loading screen that we asked our designer to make. Well, it turns <laughs> out like um, as soon as you do an action in your application, um, what we want to do in order to ensure that our validations and any of our application logic runs, we want to say that we're loading, that we actually are loading the application. So what we're doing is we're deferring the actual uh, transfer and showing that to the user so it's a better user experience um, and also making sure that everything um, is kind of working there. So now you can see that um, through this, we're able to transfer everything, and we're now we're able to upgrade the web, essentially. So, huzzah! Yeah. <laughs> All right. So thanks, Patrick. So the question we get uh, when we talk to developers about this is, okay, this is all cool. When is it going to be ready? And I think Patrick sort of jumped the gun on this uh, early on when we were uh, starting to work yeah. on it. Uh, you know, when we had some early success. Um, but the reality is that there's still work that to be done. We, we have to package this up and get it to the point, like I mentioned earlier, so that it's just really easy. So it just, it just works out of the box. And you can install the server plugin, and you don't have to worry about anything else. So it's coming soon. Stay tuned. Follow us on Twitter, and you can uh, keep up to date. Um, but it will be here. So uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, one, sorry. One more thing. Actually, yeah. one more thing I, I forgot. I, I want to give a special thanks to Tobias from the core team, uh, who's been working with, this on the, working with us on this. He has been really great to work with, an awesome guy, super smart. So thanks a lot, Tobias. I, oh, actually, sorry, thanks a lot, Tobias. Uh, this is him. Uh, he, he's awesome. So uh, follow him on Twitter as well. OK? Thanks a lot, guys. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. Okay. So up next, we've got.